Have you ever seen that 1978 movie with the Beatles music called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? It's quite a spectacle with famous actors and catchy tunes. There are plenty of characters to enjoy from the hero to the villain. Do you have a favorite? As you watch the movie, you might get caught up in certain scenes that stick with you. Is there one that you still remember long after it's over? Now, do you have any special memories or stories about this movie? Share them with us. Let's talk about Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and all the fun it brings. Get ready for a ride filled with music, laughs, and maybe a tear or two. Let's dive into the world of the movie. The 1978 film adaptation of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band received mixed reviews from audiences. Some viewers found it to be a disappointing rendition of the beloved album, criticizing its deviation from the source material and the quality of its performances. The movie loosely follows the narrative of the album, but incorporates songs from other Beatles records, with notable instances like Steve Martin's rendition of Maxwell's Silver Hammer drawing particular ire. Despite the star power of acts like the Bee Gees and Aerosmith, many felt that even they couldn't salvage the film from its flaws. Some viewers expressed frustration and disappointment, urging others to avoid the movie altogether. While a few defended its campy charm and entertainment value, the general consensus leaned towards disappointment and dissatisfaction with the film's execution. Overall, the film's attempt to capture the essence of the iconic album fell short for many, leaving them with a sense of missed potential and unfulfilled expectations. The Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band movie from 1978 got turned into a comic book, but it never officially came out in the U.S. Instead, it got released in France, the Netherlands, and Germany in limited numbers. Some folks thought it was a bit like Saturday Night Fever, but without the fever. Despite what people might think, Martin wasn't part of NBC's Saturday Night Live cast, but he set a bunch of records for showing up as a guest, hosting, and doing it all in a single season on the show. He was all set to host for the 1980-1981 season, but a writer's strike messed that up. The movie was. During the filming of the movie, Alice Cooper took a temporary leave from a New York City rehab facility where he was being treated for alcoholism. He utilized this leave to record his vocals and shoot his scenes. Paramount Pictures served as the international distributor of the film. Nearly three decades later, Paramount sold its music publishing arm, Famous Music, to Sanyadevi Music Publishing, which has owned the publishing rights to most Beatles songs since 1995. Three songs from the soundtrack made it to the Billboard Hot 100 in 1979. Gotta Get You Into My Life by Earth, Wind & Fire reached number 9. Oh Darlin performed by Robin Gibb reached number 15, and Aerosmith's rendition of Come Together hit number 23. Production of the movie began with the Bee Gees sharing a trailer. After the success of Saturday Night Fever, each Gibb was given his own trailer. Aerosmith and Alice Cooper were the only hard rock or heavy metal acts in the film. Years later, Steven Tyler of Aerosmith featured on Cooper's song Only My Heart Talkin'. Both acts made cameo appearances in Wayne's World movies in the early 1990s released by Paramount Pictures, which distributed this movie internationally. Frankie Howard, meanwhile, made his only major U.S. film appearance in this movie. Robert Stigwood had grand ambitions for the movie. He saw it as this generation's gone with the wind. The finale was a massive collaboration. Celebrities from all over were invited to sing Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. They were pampered with luxurious accommodations, transportation, and dining. Despite the film's lackluster performance, the soundtrack peaked at five on the Billboard charts, but faded quickly. It eventually went platinum, but wasn't released on CD until 1999. In scenes set on farms early in the film, fake animals make appearances, including a faux chicken and an oddly motionless sheep. Peter Frampton, keen on trampolining during being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, was denied due to lacking insurance coverage. In a 1979 interview, George Harrison expressed sympathy for Robert Stigwood, Peter Frampton, and the Bee Gees acknowledging their pre-Sergeant Pepper efforts. Harrison noted the film's potential damage to their images and careers, comparing it to the Beatles attempting the Rolling Stones, stating the Stones could do it better. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, released in 1978, faced criticism from the Bee Gees, who were dissatisfied with the film. They realized early in filming that it would fail due to its overly wholesome nature, feeling director Michael Schultz lacked creativity in the musical sequences. During recording, Alice Cooper initially attempted to mimic John Lennon's vocals for the song because, however, Sir George Martin, the producer, encouraged him to infuse the performance with his own style. Later, in 1981, Garrett recorded I Am a Rebel, featuring music by Victorio Pezzola, 
and produced by Richard Finch of KC and the Sunshine Band. The track became the theme song for an Italian TV program titled Il Baratolo. Italian censors gave the film the green light in December 1978. Oliver Reed turned down the role of Mr. Mustard amidst a disagreement with producer Robert Stigwood, opting out of joining the cast. Interestingly, Sandy Farina received an introducing credit for her role in the movie, marking a significant moment in her career. The decision to grant her this recognition hinted at the potential the filmmakers saw in her performance. It's fascinating how certain choices behind the scenes can shape the course of a film's production and the trajectory of its actors' careers. In this case, Sandy Farina's introduction to audiences was a carefully considered decision that likely played a part in shaping her future opportunities in the industry. Stargard, a funk band consisting of Rochelle Runnels, Deborah Lynn Anderson, and Janice Williams, portrayed the Diamonds in the film. Anderson departed from the group around 1979 or 1980. Donald Pleasance's character is mentioned as B.D. Hoffler in the narrative voiceover, but is officially credited as B.D. Brockhurst in the film's credits, publicity materials, and in film posters. The B.G.s declined to include the film's soundtrack in their catalog after regaining control, as they were not interested in acquiring it. Director Michael Schultz, in a 2010 interview, described his time working on the film as a mix of tremendous highs and lows. The movie marked a significant moment in American cinema, being the first major motion picture directed by an African American during the black exploitation era's success. However, both this film and the whiz faced box office failure, leading to a reluctance among major studios to hire African American directors for an extended period. The production originally approached Kiss to portray the future villain band, but the band declined, fearing potential damage to their image. Instead, Kiss opted for Kiss meets the Phantom of the Park. The unique experiences of director Michael Schultz and the film's impact on African-American directors in the industry are noteworthy aspects of its history. Kiss's rejection and their subsequent involvement in another project also add an interesting twist to the movie's production. In summary, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band stands out not only for its musical content, but also for the challenges faced by its director and the ripple effect it had on the representation of African-American directors in mainstream cinema. Rumors circulated that Andy Gibb declined the role of Billy Shears. Both Sir Paul McCartney and Sir Ringo Starr were present at the premiere, but later distanced themselves from the film. John Lennon and George Harrison opted out of watching it altogether. The soundtrack's production faced initial tension as Peter Frampton and the Bee Gees harbored reservations about each other's music's compatibility. They weren't sure how their styles would blend on the same album. Despite this, the soundtrack achieved significant commercial success. Frampton's guitar work and the Bee Gees harmonies brought a fresh twist to classic Beatles tunes. However, the film itself received mixed reviews and failed to capture the magic of the iconic album it aimed to celebrate. Despite its shortcomings, the soundtrack remains a notable highlight of the project.